Dr. Anna Kingsford, an outstanding English theosophist of the 1880s, was said to be clairvoyant from the time she could speak. She herself felt that she came from the fairy realm and was given permission to be born as a human being so as to carry out her destiny. At the tender age of 13, Anna wrote the book Beatrice, a tale of the early Christians. Her early wisdom can be seen in the following excerpt. How foolish are they who seek to promote their own comfort by making it their sole study. They lose the very object of their desires and invariably render themselves restless and unhappy. While maintaining her spiritual and vegetarian interests, Anna Kingsford became a doctor. Not only was she one of the first female medical doctors in England, she graduated from medical school without experimenting on any animals. The subject of her medical degree thesis was Vegetarianism and Ethics. This led Dr. Kingsford to the writing and publishing of a well-received book, The Perfect Way in Diet. Dr. Kingsford continued with her inner spiritual and mystical experiences, which she documented in several books, in collaboration with longtime friend Edward Maitland. She also became known as an outspoken animal and women's rights activist. We now share with you selections from the book The Perfect Way or The Finding of Christ. This book merges Christianity and the Theosophical Tradition, a system of fundamental truths and wisdom in which all religions may abide so that humans can progress along the path to perfection. According to Dr. Anna Kingsford, this perfection is exemplified by Christ, which everyone is capable of discovering and joining within. The Second Lecture The Soul and the Substance of Existence Part 2 the soul, or permanent element in man, is first engendered in the lowest forms of organic life, from which it works upwards through plants and animals to man. Its earliest manifestation is in the ethereal or fluidic material called the astral body, and it is not something added to that body, but it is generated in it by the polarization of the elements. Once generated, it enters into and passes through many bodies and continues to do so until finally perfected or finally dissipated and lost. The process of its generation is gradual. The magnetic forces of innumerable elements are directed and focused to one center, and streams of electric power pass along all their convergent poles to that center until they create their fire, a kind of crystallization of magnetic force. This is the soul the sacred fire of the hearth, called by the Greeks Hestia or Vesta, which must be kept burning continually. The astral and fluidic body, its immediate matrix, called also the perisol, and the material or fixed body put forth by this, may fall away and disappear, but the soul, once begotten and made an individual, is immortal until its own perverse will extinguishes it. For the fire of the soul must be kept alive by the divine breath if it is to endure forever. It must converge, not diverge. If it diverges, it will be dissipated. The end of progress is unity. The end of degradation is division. The soul, therefore, which ascends, tends more and more to union with and absorption into the divine. Clearest understanding may be obtained of the soul by defining it as the divine idea. Before anything can exist outwardly and materially, the idea of it must subsist in the divine mind. The soul, therefore, may be understood to be divine and everlasting in its nature, but it does not act directly upon matter. It is put forth by the divine mind, but the body is put forth by the astral or fiery body. As spirit on the celestial plane, 
is the parent of the soul, so fire on the material plane begets the body. The plane on which the celestials and creatures touch each other is the astral plane. The soul, being in its nature eternal, passes from one form to another until, in its highest stage, it polarizes sufficiently to receive the spirit. It is in all organized things. Nothing of an organic nature exists without a soul. It is the individual and perishes finally if uninformed of the spirit. This becomes readily intelligible if we conceive of God as of a vast spiritual body constituted of many individual elements, all having but one will and therefore being one. This condition of oneness with the divine will and being constitutes what, in Hindu mysticism, is called the celestial nirvana. But though becoming pure spirit or God, the individual retains his individuality. So that, instead of all being finally merged in the one, the one becomes many. Thus does God become millions. God is multitudes and nations and kingdoms and tongues, and the voice of God is as the sound of many waters. The celestial substance is continually individualizing itself, that it may build itself up into one perfect individual. Thus is the circle of life accomplished, and thus its ends meet the one with the other. But the degraded soul, on the other hand, must be conceived of as dividing more and more, until at length it is scattered into many and ceases to be as an individual, becoming, as it were, split and broken up and dispersed into many pieces. This is the Nirvana of Annihilation. The planet must not be looked upon as something apart from its offspring. It also is a person, fourfold in nature, and having four orders of offspring, of which orders man alone comprises the whole of its offspring. Some lie in the astral region only, and are but twofold, some in the watery region, and are threefold, and some in the human region, who are fourfold. The metallic and gaseous envelope of the planet are its body and perisol, the organic region comprises its soul, and the human region its spirit or divine part. When it was but metallic it had no individualized soul, when it was but organic it had no divine spirit, but when man was made in the image of God, then was its spirit breathed into its soul. Wonderful viewers, thank you for your company for today's Words of Wisdom.